Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. I am your host today, NHL defenseman, uh, Seattle Kraken defenseman, Connor Carrick. My guest is hockey coach Brian Keane. Brian is the founder of Prodigy Hockey and currently works as well with the Blackhawks development staff. Uh, I've worked personally with Brian on and off, uh, particularly in the summers, and we've done some pretty extensive video work uh, over the course of my professional career. So, what's how long now? Probably five years? Since my yeah, first year in, in Toronto, my first year after uh, the Marlies playoff run. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know, Brian, I think is an interesting, you know, case study. I've, I've had a, a good exposure early in my career to some really, you know, high-end coaches. Toronto staff, for example, had, you know, some of the likes of, you know, the Daryl Belfries of the world, uh, you know, some Mike Ellis's, some people that uh, trained under him, Barb Underhill, as well as the coaching staff was was great there as well. Um, you know, played for, you know, high end coach and, and Barry Trotz a little bit in, in training camp in Washington. Todd Reardon was his assistant, went on to be an NHL head coach. Uh, what other coaches, uh, you know, played for Jim Montgomery, who was doing, you know, quite well with Dallas and had some interesting ideas. Um, you know, played with Lindy Ruff, you know, for Lindy Ruff, who's been around forever. So it's, it's interesting when you see different people, you know, sort of take, uh, different stances on what, hockey coaching is and what you know development is and i think brian it's been really interesting to see your development into uh you know initially maybe more of a skills coach right where you're doing video analysis and and trying to add tools to guys toolbox maybe to now i i liken you maybe more to a gardener someone more interested right a gardener does not grow flowers a gardener creates an environment in which flowers can grow um is that an accurate read? Would you would you resonate with that? Yeah, definitely. I like um, it. <laughs> so one of the questions I wanted to start with was, in your opinion, what is uh, an an elite NHLer as you define it? Because you've had, you know, experience. You've been on the ice with the likes of you know Kale McCarr, uh, you know Patrick Kane, uh, you know Johnny Taze. You've you've had exposure to hockey played at the highest level. Um, what makes an elite NHL in your opinion? No, it's a good question. And thanks for having me on. Uh, I think the, the players that have this consistency over an 82 and then into a playoff run where they can make an impact night after night and be, have a skill set that allows them to solve any sort of defense or, um, any sort of scenarios, they find themselves in a lot in unique ways. So it, whether they're playing the blues or they're playing the abs or whoever you're going against, they're bringing different tactics and strategies and the player has an ability to overcome those, um, those situations and, and find ways to solve problems uniquely based on their opponents. And, and, and night in night out, I find that to be the consistency and the, the breadth of solutions as something that kind of to me sticks out in some of the elite players in the league. So how then, because there really are two buckets, right? There's the guys that are, you know, really in the the top third of the league, let's say that really make up the core of most teams. That's a term. A lot of general managers are use. Oh, he's a, he's a core player for us. He's a, he's a driver of our team, but mm-hmm. you can make a lot of money when Stanley cups, Playing cool places as an ever as an average NHL player too, and the and the facts are that you know let's call it two thirds of the league really do fall into that category. Um, right. What kind of traits in their game do you see separates them from the tier of players looking after their jobs? Well, I think it's a fine line, uh, and it's it's you know small differences, incremental differences that allow them to continue to play at that level. And I think it's a lot of it's around identity and understanding what your game is and what you bring to the table and being able to just like with some of the elite players, be super consistent with that um, and kind of build a niche for yourself and have a brand that people can see and understand when they're trading for you or signing you or they know what they're getting. Um, And then from there, trying to add things to continue to evolve their game. I think that's what I see with that um, group of players that you just described. So when it comes to training, particularly for youth players, obviously no one mm-hmm. grows up looking to be a third line center. Everyone wants to score fifty goals, you know, have 
you know, 60 assists and, you know, be in the running for, you know, the Hart Trophy and things like that. Um, but how can we train a youth player to, and, and I'm thinking particularly the younger you are, I think you can, you can really push the envelope. You can really push the ceiling. It's, it's skill development above all, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But maybe as we get into 15, 16, 17 years old, kids that are starting to take an identity and, and, a, and a shape to their to the game, how can we train a youth player to fall into these two buckets? And, and you train these players. You train national team development players, uh, guys in the yeah. OHL. And, and what kind of is your approach with those players? Do you talk a lot about identity? Do you tailor it to the type of player that they are a lot? Yeah, no, I'd certainly look at their uniqueness. What do they do really well that we as a group in that partnership think that they're going to be able to do at a higher level and and continue to stimulate that while also looking at weaknesses in areas that maybe they can continue to improve upon. But ultimately, there's only one Connor Carrick. There's only one Patrick Kane. Like every, We're all unique. So I need me as the you know, the facilitator of their skill development, I need to understand them as people and understand their games so that I can help them find that uniqueness and, and build that identity and make it strong. So they really know what, you know, what they're bringing to the table and, and how can we keep evolving those major assets that they have in, in their toolkit. So one of the things that I, you know, really respect about you is, is how much, you know, video work you put into trying to learn about, you know, your clients, uh, but also players that they play against. And I always think you can't underestimate, um, you know, the brilliance of a, of a professional, right? There's, there's just things you pick up from doing it every day. That's what I am as a hockey player, right? I can hear, you know, Mike Babcock in the mm-hmm. back of my head, like, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be an every day or, you know? Um, and so <laughs> in studying both the stars and, and, We'll start with the stars. Who is a star player that in your studies and in all the video that you've watched, you knew that they were good, but you didn't recognize just how good they were. Who is a player that kind of comes to mind in that realm? It's a great question. I think it, and you and I have had some of these discussion um, in the past, but even, um, let me think, there's a lot. There's a lot of players that, you know, after watching over and over and over again, you see the subtleties that if you just watch one shift or watch one game, and you're not really focused on them, you'd miss it. Um, but I think definitely uh, guys like Drew Doughty, some of the yeah. subtle things he does defensively or with the puck, um, I think a Shifley would, for me, would fall in that category. Um and I think even like guys, you know, I study Kaner all the time because I, and I work with him. So I, I see it up close and personal, but some of the things he does that are, that if you don't watch a lot of them and you don't really um, become attuned to it, it's just subtle things that he uses to his advantage to um, be able to make plays and, and be successful. So I, I would say that the majority of guys that play at your level have something that if you watch them a lot, you're going to pick, Oh, I didn't notice that. And that's something that's unique to them that that allows them to be successful at that high of a level. Yeah. I always think that that's a cool, you just, you're able to gain an appreciation for certain players that you're around every day. Like I remember as a young player, I was around, you know, Nick Backstrom a little bit in training camp and things like that. And I swear it was like, hmm. might've been two months where practice or a game, I felt like a pass near him or made by him wasn't totally clean. Like it didn't matter. Puck in his feet, puck in the air, he'd knock it down. Uh, it it was artwork. You know, I remember you know Alex Ovechkin was taking uh, one timers after practice one time, and with that massive hook, and and we've seen like how many <laughs> ugly goals he's had over his career, right? Like you almost wonder, like man, maybe he's just maybe he's so violent with it. And goalies have have created. There's such a fear factor now around his, you know, backside one timer that you you do see a lot of shots. Maybe maybe they're not perfect shots. And then I saw him after practice. I'm like, mm-hmm. I think he took 30, and 29 of them hit the elbows, and like one wrapped around the wall. And it was it was it was so cool to see up front and and personal just what you know the greatest goal scorer you know of, of our modern era like. 
man, like right. his one timer, even despite that curve, is so tight in terms of how close his miss is. Um, you know, but then there's some things that you don't expect, right? Like, so I, I have the luxury of of working out a lot with Ian Mack and and that you know with Kaner, and like people have no idea how strong he is. People have no idea mm-hmm. how robust his aerobic system is, like the, how quickly his heart rate plunges. You know, after certain certain uh you know training demands, and it it is cool, right? Because that's the only way you're judged. You're not judged off one game. You're not judged off, you know, even really for right. guys of that caliber. One playoff run, you know, frankly, you, know, you got to do it for every year. Um, but you see, right. it. you see the way they're able to recover. You see the way that they're able to add, you know, year in year out. Um, what is something that you think each caliber of player, so the top dogs? can learn from some of the you know more grinding players players that have had to really carve out a niche um what's something that you think they could learn from some of the 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 grittier you know maybe more blue collar players in their lineup yeah good question well i think most of those elite players already have an appetite for evolving their game but sometimes I think the process of doing that um, and having those moments where things are difficult, the the player that the other player that you're describing might interact with that more mm-hmm. and have to overcome that on a more consistent basis. Um, I think at, at both levels, you're encountering a lot of challenges throughout the season. Um, but like when making a technical or tactical change, you know, going through that process, I think. Um, sometimes because some things have come easier, um, understanding the process and what it takes, the time it takes and what that looks like, maybe the player that's trying to stay a little bit might understand that better. But I would say I'm lucky that the guys that we would put in that elite bucket that I've worked with have been all in on that, you know, so, but it's just, that's something that maybe comes to mind with players that I think like what you just described, like you can be an elite player for a year or one playoff round, but can you sustain it over five to 10 years? And that's the difference between like, you know, hall of fame and being good for a short amount of time. The guys that are going to be those hall of famers find ways to evolve and keep, keep adding layers to their game. And it might be a two to three, 4% uptick, but it makes a difference and it keeps them um, being adaptable to as the game evolves and teams evolve. So what about the other way? What about, you know, some of your average, you know, NHLers, third, fourth line guys, guys that are out of the lineup. What is something that, you know, can be mental, can be, you know, physical? And this is a, can be a general or vague question, but can steal from, you know, some of the top dogs in the game. What's something that comes, because I, so for example, like a question that, uh, an answer to my own question that I thought of uh, in the, in the last question is, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in particular is, uh, their health and their training, right? Mm-hmm. Guys in the bottom halves of lineups, no, they cannot get hurt. They cannot get sick. Mm-hmm. And there, there's a certain sharpness and respect for their craft that of the top players, some of them have it, right? Like it's, uh, you know, Nate McKinnon, you know, Nixon, Alfredo sauce at the, you know, the article that came out recently, right? Like there is some of that yeah. um, push, and, and drive, you know, for, from your top players, uh, you know, Kaner eats as healthy as they come, right? Like he's, he's really takes his energy yeah. levels seriously. Um, but that's something on the whole that I see uh, adherence to at a, at a greater rate out of the bottom halves of lineups. Like these guys really take care of their body. They really take care of their sleep. They're, they have to, they have to be dialed in the margin for error, you know, for, for certain faceoff guys, it might be if they go five for eight versus three for eight on draws, it might be you know, a big difference in how their third period usage is, right? Um, Versus we're talking a little bit about a a player I'd played with, you know, off the air before we started that had just this air of unwavering confidence, right? And that's something that, yeah, certain, you know, players I've played with, um, mistake, dash five, nah, doesn't matter. Um, part of that is because right. they're like, it, is that the reason that they're, are, are they that way because they are a top player or is the reason mm-hmm. that they are that way that, you know what I mean? Like, um, uh, 
I'm getting twisted around in my own yeah, verbiage, yep. but you get the idea. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I think one thing that comes to mind is that, yeah, like when you only have 10 shifts in a game to prove yourself, potentially, you, you know, or to be able to be back in the lineup the next night, there's a heightened awareness of that. So being able to control your emotions, get your heart rate down and be, and when bad things happen where maybe the elite player, you know, quote unquote, might mess up and thinks nothing of and just lets it go. You know, that player that's trying to survive might hold on to that a little bit more and that might impact their next shift. So being able to kind of let that go, that's something that comes to mind for me. And in college hockey, that's that was me, and I wasn't able to let it go. And obviously, I didn't play at the NHL level or interact with some of the things you know you or some of the guys are talking about has to as far as like providing for your family. And there's a lot of other external uh, pressures, um, but that's something that comes to mind for me. Allowing that bad play to just flow and go through the mind and, and out the other end and be able to refocus and trust your identity, trust your, your skill set, that next shift to be able to, to bring your best performance. Now to transition a little bit in terms of getting into more X's and O's and, and tactics and how you train players uniquely. Mm-hmm. Um, what aspect of a pro player's game do you feel you can best facilitate learning and transfer for what are some of the things that you have tried to really identify? So, so for example, like one that um, I was talking with a pro player who worked with a, a consultant who might be considered a competitive, uh, a competitor of yours, if we believe in that. Right. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he was getting frustrated with, he's like, he's like, listen, I'm a fourth line center and the guy I'm working with, he keeps trying to teach me this Matthew shot. Dude, it ain't coming. Like I'm, I'm in my upper twenties. It ain't coming. Like I need to work on this, whatever this was. Um, you know, so what are some of those high, you know, ROI type items you've been able to work with, with already high caliber players? Well, I think, you know, understanding the process of identifying those, you know, those important areas and like you and I have done in the past, it's collaborative. It has to be collaborative because if you aren't all in on it, then us going out and working on it isn't really going to produce a lot of results. You need to be all in. And I'm saying you as in the player, whoever we're talking about, you have to be completely committed to that process and understand this is going to help your performance. It's going to help your game. So that step, a couple steps before you even hop on the ice to me is like one of the most important things. And each individual is going to have different there might be overlap, but there's going to be different things that are more high priority. And that discussion and, you know, the player having some autonomy and it, as well as guidance from support from someone like me, that's, I think, a really important, um, you know, combo to have to start to attack some things that are going to be important for their game. Yeah, so I guess I'll give a, a concrete example, like something that I think we did a really nice job on earlier in my career. Was at the American League level, I trusted my puck play, just kind of my reach and my skating to roll out the back of plays, right? So maybe I picked the puck up, you know, I'm a right shot, you know, on the left side of the ice, I was wheeling, you know, in the neutral zone to, towards my forehand, notice that all five defenders were on one side and then decide to curl out my backhand and hinge out the weak side, right? Versus the, the NHL level, mm-hmm. in an effort to play fast, I might have pounded that you know, up the strong side into, you know, eight bodies, you know, five of them being my opponents uh, and, and have to deal with a rush coming back at me. Um, or similarly, you know, it, it off the breakout, right? So say I receive, you know, a little bump in my left corner from my D partner who took a hit. I'm wheeling towards, you know, my forehand yeah. side, want to come up the wall and eh, nothing's there and being able to come out my backhand side again. Um, is there something... I guess of a of a player comparable it can be a younger player, it can be a pro player, where you really were able to hone us in on a particular skill over the course of a summer, where there was concrete evidence and, and just a conversation that you two had after of like, and you don't have to necessarily reveal the client's name, but like, wow, 
we mm. added that. That was not present, and we really sharpened the knife with that skill set, with that tool there. Yeah, no, there's well, there's there's a lot of players. Hopefully, I, tons I of examples. Like we've but done that just to get the listener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and you know, it's not just one time we see them do it in a game. Like, oh, success. You know, it's tracking that over the course of the year, tracking that transfer to see, you know, if that player's in that moment, you know, a number of times, are they making that right decision that we created and and we talked about and we started to work through in the previous summer or, you know, maybe even longer than that. And learning's not linear. It's not just like, yep, you got it. You're good good for life. It's there. Some things become really ingrained and, but the, the situations you just described are going to be constantly changing. So for, for us, it's, yeah, it's having that discussion. It's figuring out, um, you know, what you're not interacting with in those moments that's not allowing you to make that play yet. And maybe it's a technical thing. Maybe it's a perceptual component, um, and then helping you work work in the, in it in that moment and under various types of pressures um, and seeing how you can solve it uh, and kind of guiding you through that process of scaling that up um, and and helping you figure out how you can solve version A B C D of that moment um, with a number of different assets that either we're helping you build new tools or tools that you already have, but you just aren't deploying skillfully. So in terms of how you have coached over the years, like I've noticed a change, a a growth rather is I think a a more precise word. Um, I feel earlier in our relationship, there was a a heavy amount of isolated skills, right? We've identified cutbacks on the breakout. We've identified, you know, overshooting and not seeing the weak side of the ice at the offensive blue line, you know, cause you're getting too locked in your decision. Mm-hmm. Right. And we would, you know, kind of coach, uh, skill sets around that in an, in an isolated repeatable, you know, with, with repetition being King kind of being the model into, I feel I've seen yeah. you morph into more of, um, and that's why I use the gardening analogy to, at the start, you know, smaller ice games, games with particular rules, right? And I know there was a podcast you had sent me about, you know, jujitsu coaching. And the example uh, in the podcast mm-hmm. was uh, there was a, a heavy emphasis in jujitsu of late on ankle locks. And he's like, and I didn't want my uh, clients or, you know, the trainees, frankly, to be breaking each other's ankles. So I had to like create a game that wasn't just to execute this ankle lock. And so what he did was he asked his students to, uh, like a, a point would be awarded if they took the other person's socks off, right? Because that would demonstrate control of the other person's foot, which I don't do jujitsu. Um, but, you know, he, he <laughs> determined that that was relevant enough to the skill. So why have you made that transition? Who influenced you to, to, to do that transition? And what is it you're trying to really accomplish in your games? Well, I yeah, I, I think, yeah, I've definitely... Um, invested a lot in being a uh, gardener or an architect of problems versus, you know, kind of only focusing on repeating the solutions. So the way, you know, and this has been through a lot of studying and reflection on what has worked for players, what is not. um, And, you know, and it's been a lot of fun. I, I, I love learning about how people learn and, I've really invested a lot in reading research and talking with other coaches and other sports and all sorts of things. And it's, it's been a really fun ride. And it means a lot that you recognize that, you know, what I feel is progress. Um, so I appreciate you saying that. Uh, but yeah, the, the main thing is within that problem I've in, we can call it a game or a problem that I've presented to you. I want you to be in it and be able to work that problem and find figure out solutions um, within it. And when you have a problem that has a very specific task goal, you're going to get feedback from that activity that we designed, that task, that problem that we designed for you. And then I'm also gonna be on the side and supporting you through that. 
So if it's, if it's a technical component, that's not, you're seeing it, you're interacting with the problem in a way that is relevant to what you're going to see in the game and as close as possible as we can, we can make it. And you're just not executing. Maybe we do need to remove you from that and work on some technical components. But I think the more you can be in it and be seeing what you're going to see in the game and what information, like as in pressure, space, the net, whatever, the information is in front of you. Um, if you can interact with that and see that, that's going to allow you to transfer it, transfer it into the game. It's called representative learning design. So making things close to what you're going to have to deal with. Um, so And sometimes you need to scale down the speed. Sometimes you need to scale down the amount of players. But finding out where you need to, where the challenge point is um, at a good rate for you, the individual, to learn and, and to keep growing your, your capacities within that situation. What have been your favorite sports to learn from? Where have you been um, doing most of your research? Well, a lot of, you know, English Premier League teams and football, European football, soccer, um, they've done a lot of research. Um, the Australian Institute of Sport has done a lot of research on perception, um, motor development. And there's, yeah, there's 50 to 60 years of motor skill development research that's out there that I've dug into. Um, someone I've really who is a researcher that I've really dug into is Keith Davids. And he's, his focus has been ecological dynamics, which is a theory around how movement is developed. Um, so there's, there's a lot, but yeah, soccer for sure. Um, I would say that some other sports, you know, basketball, there's some really good people on the basketball side that I follow and think bring a lot to the table and on the skill development realm of things. Um, field hockey has a lot, if you can believe it. Um, oh. what else? Rugby. So a lot of these sports that maybe have similar type of, um, you know, they're invasion sports similar to oh. hockey. There's going to be some crossover. And again, it doesn't mean it's exact, but there's things we can take from what they've done and certainly, uh, utilize it in our coaching. Um, you know, for, for the sport of hockey. How do you define ecological dynamics um, as you try to use it and apply it to your coaching? So it's to me, and again, I'm always learning and um, trying to better understand these things. Ecological psychology, which is basically to me, like how movement is regulated. So our decisions and how we interact with the environment around us um, are signaled or, or deployed by what's around us. So if you're in front of me, Connor, and you're walking towards me, I need to read you if I don't want to run into you. So I'm going to go left. Right. So I, I need to understand I, that theory of thinking is that how you interact with the environment regulates your movements. And then the or complex systems, are, which is the dy dynamic end of ecological dynamics is the interaction of systems. So our brains, biomechanics, body are all systems interacting that, and we're interacting with the environment. So that's a, a frame of reference for basically understanding how things are um, coming together and emerging um, in sport movement or just walking down the street. Um, but basically at the, I think at the just that's a lot of info, I guess, but I think in a simple way, it's understanding how, how movement emerges. And then from you know, a development standpoint, how that movement emerged is a problem potentially, or a task that can be designed that if you want to work on what the solutions are, that might, you know, that's the way I start to look at after I've studied video of someone starting to figure out, you know, what, what do we need to design to help this player start to improve these specific situations in, in these specific situations and what the solutions might look like, but more so understanding the problems that they're facing. Interesting. It's a great name, ecological dynamics. Um, yes. Is there, what experience have you had? You mentioned uh, learning a lot, how people learn. 
What is it exactly that you've been learning? What is it like, were you running into a particular type of student that you were having a hard time with, or were you having particular success with a, a learning style that you started to notice uh, how important that differentiation was? Cause I, I don't know when it really started, but I might've been, you know, one of the first generations where that was like talked about in school, right? Like, Oh, we're going to take a test. We're going to figure mm -hmm. out how everyone learns. Oh, you're more auditory. You're more visual. We're going to try to cater and, 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 uh, you know, develop a curriculum for everybody. Um, but you know, now that concept has been out for quite some time and, and kind of been in the public's, you know, knowledge that this is a real thing. It's not that it's just a particular student isn't paying attention. Um, what kind of progress have you been able to make as a coach in that realm? Or, you know, what, what have you really learned that you think you could gift our listener about today? Yeah, no, I, I think I've learned a lot and it's all been in a, in a, uh, for me in my coaching to better understand how people learn is going to help me be a better coach. So it's all in a effort to be more myself, be more skillful and be under, understand, you know, my, how my interactions with you might be better. So that's where I started. And I think, you know, the big thing for me has always been one, if I can personally can learn faster or learn or help someone else learn something, um, I think I'm going to be a pretty good teacher and hopefully a good coach. Um, and I think those, for me, those two names are, you know, one and the same. I, I want to, I'm mm -hmm. a teacher. That's how I see myself. Um, but yeah, as far as something that, you know, from the lear learning, um, realm, you know, I would say that, you know, asking a lot of questions, um, in inviting an active um, participant versus a passive participant in, in a dialogue. Um, I would say things that really stick out and what we kind of just described, allowing someone solve a work to solve a problem and being there as their support system. Um, but allowing them to go down that, that journey. That's another thing that I've spent a lot of time researching and trying to learn about. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think, but yeah, I think those two things, I, I guess, would be two of the ma more major parts of learning that I've really, you know, spent a lot of time myself, like engaging with and, and also with my students seeing good progress by trying to engage with them differently than just being so prescriptive and being, you need to do this here, you need to do that here, just rip out this isolated solution for as long as possible. And, and again, there's always, there's a time and place for certain things. And, um, certainly if someone's not getting something over a long period of time, I need to change up my approach. Um, I think that's what a good coach does. They're adaptable too. they're try We're trying to, um, adapt to the situations and problems that we're facing. Um, but yeah, I, th I think those two, if I, if I could grab two of the more important ones would be activating someone and in engaging with them, asking them questions, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, understanding from their perspective, and then allowing someone to solve problem, solve the problem, right? And don't get in the way of that. And sometimes that's a really hard thing. It's a hard thing for me sometimes to let, you know, not jump in and be like, oh, you need to do this here. You know, let them keep working it. If you, if you create a good task or drill activity, whatever you want to call it, let them keep working it. And that's something you and I have talked about too. And you've given me good feedback on as far as like, let's stick with this. Let's keep going. Let's keep working this. Let's not uh, go to the next thing. I want to feel this out more. If that makes yeah, sense. For me, for me, what I was most excited about in the, in the development of our work was I think as a player, it's important to change what you're doing for sure, but you're not really like doing the game. Like you, you're not executing like isolated mechanical skills all game long. Like you're, you're feeling, which I think is like a, a mm -hmm. close cousin to seeing, right? Cause I do make plays that I don't see out there. Yeah. Right. Uh, but they are kind of of yeah. that perception eyesight type, you know, uh, system. And, you know, let's, let's go back to the offensive blue line example, right? You can sort of set up a drill 
or or an ask of my body and of my of my technical skill set. But if if there's really three options at the blue line, one is shoot, two is pass to somebody that's wide open, three is just to try to get it deep because mm-hmm. I've one and two aren't there. Like the the most important part is creating a level of comfort at the point at which one of those three decisions is made. The actual execution of that right. will totally depend on the clarity of what I'm feeling at the moment, right? Like it's almost like uh, we call it the like breakaway speed, right? All of a sudden you see a guy, the lane opens mm. wide up and he, he's got the breakaway juice. This guy can fly. It's like, okay, where was that skating all the other times? Well, there was, there was clarity. He knew exactly where he was going, right? right? Or like when you see an open net and you just bang, you squash the bug, you, you hammer that puck into the back end. You can't wait to get that in there. Right. Versus right. your shot technique is totally different when you're shooting and you're like, you kind of hope when it goes in or you kind of know it, it's not right. You're shooting from a distance. Goalie's mm-hmm. kind of staring right at you. You shoot it, but like no one believed that that was going in, neither shooter nor goalie. Um, and so when you can change what the player's feeling, because that that to me was the most important. There are moments in a game where you think you have a green light. You feel you've seen a play. You feel you have identified a pattern. And you were wrong. There was a guy there. There was a guy yeah. on the other side of the net. You didn't see that guy stick there. Right. Your guy was actually a lefty and not a righty, right? And so improving that sense, really having like that that brain body rush that you can only get from a game. And really what it was for me is, and and I'm, uh, that's why I was, I was so happy this summer particularly went down that route was, you know, you ask any player, when are you playing your best? Oh, that's easy. When I'm, when I'm, when I'm playing a lot. All right, clearly that's the training technique that we need to to drum up then. That's 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 the game we need to like alchemize and and make most possible with the least amount of risk, right? Cuz 5 on 5 full contact mm-hmm. hockey obviously yeah. comes at a cost. Um but you yeah. ask any player it's it's when they're getting true defense, right? Like or, or true obstacles. It's not calibrated, it's not something that the coach told them to do. Um it's a not a random game, but a, a game with patterns with other players purposely trying to disorient those patterns for you. Um, yeah. And when I was feeling something different, that was the most exciting, I guess, practice development that I think we've had. No, I, that's, I'm really happy to hear that. And I, and that's, that's the whole point of it. The decision is emergent based on info in front of you, specifying information that's regulating what you might do. So if, if I just tell you beforehand, Connor, you're going to shave ice here, go back to the wall and shoot, you're not connecting with the problem. You've already been told no. the solution. So you're not making that decision emergently. Um, so that's my thought process, with, thought process with a lot of this is, you know, the more I can help you interact with those that information that you're going to see in the game and start to solve that quicker, see it quicker. And perception doesn't mean just your eyes feel sensory. It's all those things. Right. So um, that makes me very happy to hear that because when you're in those moments and like, it's a little crunchy and you're not really comfortable, that's progress. That's where you're, you are a little bit, um, outside your challenge point it's not just 100 percent success rate you're that's where you're going to see adaptation and be able to start to adapt to all those different things coming your way and that's where i feel like good coaches can really scale that up in a nice way that allows for you know learning is different than performance Mm -hmm. learning in the summer means that you are in that moment where you're a little bit uncomfortable Um, and that uncomfortability should start to breed some adaptation and, and some progress performance. I'm just going to have you rep something out. And my hope is that the design allows you to have, you know, 90 to hundred percent success rate and you're just feeling good. So those are two different animals though. Do you have a particular game right now? That's one of your favorites that you're most proud of that you've been able to sort of coin and develop the rules for without having to get the whiteboard out. <laughs> uh, I would say I'm in a constant uh, battle with myself (laughs) as far as like, you know, is this right for this group? And 
So I wouldn't say I, I would say that I'm constantly changing a few of them that you've participated in to kind of make it better for who's in front of me. But I'd be actually curious what which one you've liked the most, to be honest. If you don't, if I can um, ask the question. I really <laughs> liked, we we're playing like that. Uh, it was like a three on three game where you had to have, it was in the neutral zone. So you had both nets just inside the blue line. And there was, right. uh, you had to have one player sort of high, right? Because all of a sudden in three on three in the summer, it turns into this guilt-free offense cheat fest where all three players, yeah. you know, you'll see all three players in on a rush. It's not exactly a cre- clean rush, but they don't really care because it's not that far to try to back check. Um, and frankly, they just don't have a head coach like holding them accountable, right? Versus, I mean, oh my God, if you're playing five on five and you're on the road against Winnipeg and you give up a breakaway, like that whole skate back trying to chase that guy down. Like the building's crumbling, right? Like your stomach's dropping. It's a it's a big mistake. So it's something you think about when you're like, okay, I'm the last guy back. Do I do I lunge right versus in three on three? You just don't. So you forced. There was like a little lane in the middle that both teams had to keep at all times. A third offensive player out. And what I liked about that was it also challenged the offensive team to create offense at a different range, right? Yeah. Um. And I think that's actually been a development in the NHL, right? Where, all right, I remember when I first came to the league, uh, let's try to go low to high. Let's try to funnel pucks to the net. Let's make goalies are super good. Let's not challenge them, really. Let's just try to make it so that they can't see. Let's bounce something off of them, make it as random and as ugly as possible because that's the best way to overcome their skill. Offensive players on a whole don't have the skill to overcome this goalie skill with a save percentage, you know, in the mid nines. And let's just make it ugly. Let's make it hell. Let's, you know, how many times you hear that, right? Let's get in the goalie's eyes. Let's let's create net front traffic. Um, but now you're seeing as the game gets, you know, bigger, faster, stronger, and definitely more skilled, um, players be able to score from distance. Players be able to create yeah. offense off the rush from a, like, you know, you'll see it with particularly the elite shooters, right? Like Matthews, Ovechkin, Line A, uh, remember, or I'm thinking of, um, remember Kucherov had that lunging one timer goal in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. He'd like, it, it yeah. was, it was kind of like, he kind of had a, like a clear lane. There was a pass that got over to him on kind of a broken two on one. And he just decided to one time and it went five hole. And it was kind of one of those like, <laughs> well, a good thing that went in. Cause that was kind of an odd shot. You know, I thought he could have taken more, but he, he, he felt something that he took that right. Like the guy had 200 points last year or whatever it was. Um, so clearly he felt something you'll see line a, a bit to it where it's like, you know, he's shooting from this, uh, Sid did it Crosby. We are playing him down the stretch where I think we played Pittsburgh twice in a row on the road. And he took this one timer from like the goal line from the middle of the rink. Right. So it's just this, this angle that you wouldn't necessarily, um, see. So I, I think it's been, I think it was a, it was a cool way to create you know, depth and width in a way in a, in a defensive responsibility that was similar to what you'd get five on five, right? Cause it's hard. You just don't have right. four lines on both sides. You just don't have 40 NHL skaters at every skate, you know, any given, right. you know, July, you know, 20th. Um, right. So something that I've thought about and, and you've talked about with some of your clients, right? The conversations around, all right, we, we've got a plan and, and try to, you know, develop for success now and then as soon as your players go away, you're like, okay, what do we do right? What do we do wrong this summer? How can I help Patrick Kane? You know, how do I help Connor Carrick play five years from now? What's the game going to look like five, 10 years from now? So let's go to, you know, hockey utopia for, you know, let's call it 10 years from now. What does training look like in the off season? What does the schedule look like? So I'll give kind of a base schedule that I think is standard, you know, amongst most guys. A lot of guys will start to skate. Yeah mid to early July, right? That used to be August, right? You talk to, you know, the Gino Cavallini's of the world and they'll be like, ah, oh, I didn't even unzip my bag till August 10th. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and that was kind of an older way of doing things. They would, they would wait train all summer, you know, maybe do some track work. If you were doing yoga, you were really ahead of the curve. Uh, now guys are taking, you know, so mid to early July, they're on the ice. Let's call it two to four times a week, August. Uh, it's four to five generally most players uh they're in the gym five days a week um 
there's definitely been more guys doing what would be a, a very rough and broad term of mobility work. Um, guys concerned about, you know, yeah. joint health, you know, especially, you know, as I get older, I'm generally around, you know, some older players. Um, but there's been some differences even I noticed. Like we were talking about, you know, Seattle. We were, we're a big club, right? Like we haven't even started training camp yet. And you can see like guys are big. It came up in, you know, my New Jersey, you know, uh, kind of exit meetings. Like they're pretty forward. They were going to have an effort to be big. Um, you know, Montreal had uh, some bigger defense and the Islanders have had, you know, some bigger teams that had success. Right. So it's a cat. It's a, it's a copycat league. Um, I think a lot of coaches like yourself are trying to consult other sports and, and ask, what is it you're doing different? What would you do differently in our sport? Mm-hmm. So hockey utopia, like, what do you, what do you think the, the Monday through Sunday, you know, sort of uh training schedule looks, you know, particularly as it gets into, um, you know, closer to the season uh, and guys really get ready? It's a great question. I really, um, to me, like what's going to change and continue to evolve is the understanding of, you know, identifying those opportunities for development. I think, I think as something like I'm really pushing our company to do in Prodigy Hockey and, um, I know a lot of people that are, 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 you know, you said competitors or I guess competitors of, of mine are constantly pushing the envelope. And if you can, if they have good analysis and you understand and you have a good buy-in from the player, you know, we can really maximize time. Um, and I, so that would be number one. Everyone's getting in. I mean, it's probably on the team level too. teams and, and individuals are getting better at, identifying those opportunities and then a real collaboration. Um, and I, I would say that I feel like, you know, there is, that's headed in the right direction. And then for me and some of our, um, partnerships, um, but understanding like how the you know, a sports psychologist, a strength conditioning coach and his skills facilitator are all going to interact. And, to, to get the most for the player. I think that's going to evolve. And under, and then also like just the openness for the players of like, I know I, we, this is proven we can make progress here. So let's really, let's invest in it. Let's push ourselves to utilize that time. Now, I don't know if it's going to change a lot at this point, you know, what the, you know, what that would look like from a scheduling perspective. But I think just, be like evolving those areas. Um, I think we're on the way towards that. Um, and I, and I think, um, it's going to be interesting to see how much more we can get out of analysis, how much more we can get out of development programs, um, and really utilizing all these different resources. They're kind of siloed a little bit to kind of work together for the athlete. Yeah, it's interesting. So like one of the things that I've I remember there was a there was a particular player. So so one of the greatest limiting factors I feel for people in your position is the length of time. You don't have, you yep. know, 4 years to get ready for the next Olympics, right? You have like 3 months, 4 months maybe. Which is a lot of time. You can you can do plenty. Um uh, but it's not a massive uh, you know, amount of time. So one of the things I remember there was a player we're doing uh body fat one of my first years and uh he figured out which day we were doing it. And this guy was, you know, very lean, super strong. And uh, he was all excited. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with dessert or cookies. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But he basically, now that body fat was done, he was uh, going to go home and have, you know, this this massive cookie uh, dessert that he was all excited for. And another player... <laughs> Right. So I would consider he had what would be considered like a a dietary mindset. Right. So he had this thought that I am getting ready for the first day of camp and I am peaking for that day. Right. There was another player who was a little bit, you know, further down the it was it was Brooks Orpik. Brooks Orpik was the player um, that brought up the second comment. And he was kind of one of the beacons for, uh, 
you know, healthy living lifestyle. It, it wasn't a diet for him. Right. It was something he did all the time. Right. And he, he was scratching his head. He's like, sort of not lecturing the other player, but asking in a, in a humorous tone. He's like, dude, like I, that is ass backwards to me. He's like, you like got in the best shape you possibly could for the caliper, some arbitrary test. He goes, and now you're going to go, you know, binge the rest of the day uh, in preparation for your real season. Like the real season starts now, right? Where you really should do everything you can to feel good, right? So, and that's something that the game, it kind of used to be that way. Guys would train, you know, for testing, for training camp so that they could, you know, kind of pass the eye test versus now physical fitness and and longevity and, and, and healthy living is a lifestyle for a lot of these players, right? I think, um, you know, on your end, I think on the skill side, and I, I've been able to kind of see you do it with the Blackhawks, and I, I really appreciate the model, is this skill development, this is not like a summer project thing only, right? Uh, Adam Oates uses the example that uh, his whole idea for his position in pro hockey was he was watching a, a NBA championship and LeBron was working with his like own personal skills coach during the um, mm-hmm. NBA championships. And he's like, huh, interesting. Like there's, there's room for that. You know, it's a similar schedule, you know, interesting. Right. And so that's something that I think in your world, this will be more of less of something in preparation for the season. And this is just something we always do. We're always evolving. We're always, you know, sharpening the sword. We're always coming back to some of these high ROI items. And we're just mm-hmm. maybe going to bring up some of our longer term, you know, goals that we have for you as a player, you know, just to kind of microdose them um, during the season. So that, that was an interesting point. I do have on here as a question, and I, I thought this one is important because a lot of times as a player, you always want to add, add, add as a coach, you know, you want to add, um, you know, every, you know, you, you meet new strength coaches. They have new stretches. They think your hip health will be fixed by this one thing you need to add all the time. And it's like, I've only got 24 hours, right? So what is something as a coach you have stopped doing, uh, that has made you better as a coach slash made your players better? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that I've stopped being so prescriptive with what I think the player should do um, as from a solution standpoint. And we kind of hit on it earlier too, but I think that was something that my coaching's evolved from that. Um, and that's something I really, I, you know, certainly give ideas and provide models for a player, but I, I'm not as like, square peg round hole. You need to do this. This is it. Um, and yeah, that's something I feel like has helped my coaching a lot. Um, not being so fixed with my mindset, like being open and really learning more about the person in front of me versus kind of coming in with, well, you're, I think this is right. So you're going to do this and so on and so forth. Um, everyone's, has their unique assets and personality traits. So I need, I need to learn about you. I need to be better at understanding Connor Carrick. If I can do that in your game, now we're going to, we're going to find some good grooves where we can attack and, and improve. Interesting. And, and, and um, I guess in an effort to destigmatize uh, doing the work and, um, you know, male pro athlete vulnerability, maybe in my NHL career, I have, I have two questions and we'll finish with this. You've been alongside it for quite some time. Um, what is something that you feel has held me back or led to performance that when you watch the tape, you're like, Connor, you're better than that. I know it. I know you're better than that. Um, what is something that comes to mind? There's a there's a yeah, positive would, coming too. I'm not gonna ma- I'm not gonna make you end on dogging me, but <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a really good question. For me, like when I when I've seen you have really good performances, you're you're really engaged in in the moment, and you're believing in your brand and your identity. So when you aren't, 
that's where I see where there's, you aren't connecting with the problem in front of you and you aren't able to execute at the ability that you, the abilities you have. So the, to me, it's like when you're truly believing in your identity as a player and understanding this is what I do well, and I'm, I just trust it and I'm just going to go do it. Um, we see good performances. Yeah, that's, I that's actually had that recently. Years. I actually had that recently. So I got out here to Seattle and you're all excited. It's the first day you got, you know, new gear and, you know, new rank, especially with, you know, it being inaugural year. And I remember after the skate went by, I was like, I was good today, but like, I don't really remember like really seeing every play and every player, right? Like, I, I don't remember like the focus really driving outside of my eyes, outside of my head. Mm -hmm. And I know that was a cue that, you know, we've talked a lot about that I found. It's one of those things that when it, when it's on the forefront, I've had periods where it's really clear and like anything, it's, it's hard to remember what you wrote on the list for the grocery store, right? Like we're talking about high end, you know, pro sport performance. It's hard to remember everything, you know, um, right. You know, so I'll forget it sometimes, but, um, really paying attention through my eyes has been, I think, a coaching point that you gave me a couple years ago that I've really um, done my best to remember, obviously, mm -hmm. in practice. Right. Uh, but, you know, th th there really was. Like, even from to the second day, I'm like, okay, I remember more green light moments. I remember reading and feeling a the stick there. I remember being like, the game's going on outside of me, right? Like, I'm just one-tenth of the puzzle. So if I'm just focused on me, yeah. like, I'm missing 90% of the information. And, you know, you can throw the puck in there, right? right? Like, maybe the puck's the extra five, right? So 95% of the information. Um, right. Pay attention to the game. Right. Cool. Brian, I really appreciate your time. Um, always enjoy, you know, throwing down. Where can people, uh, if they want to find you, I know you're active on social media, uh, not tremendously, but I, I actually do appreciate a lot of the articles you've been writing recently. I think, uh, I don't know if you've been doing those for a long time, but I've noticed of late, in particular, I've gotten a handful of them. Uh, really useful. Uh, how can people get in touch with you if they want to work with you as a client? Uh, follow you on on social media, etc. Yeah, we're on Twitter at Prodigy Hockey. We're on Instagram at Prodigy Hockey, and then you can find us at Prodigy-Hockey.com for if you if you want to work with us. And anyway, I'll, also we'll respond to messages on some of the social media. Um, but yeah, we've been I've been trying to write more and get some more information out there and it helps me consolidate some of the things I'm learning. So I um, appreciate it. Glad you enjoyed them. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.